Okay, so welcome to Conscious Living Parents, where we talk uh, parenting, partnering, personing, and everything in between. Today, we're lucky enough to have one of my uh, absolute favorite relationship experts, uh, Dr. George Blair West. Um, funnily enough, I first got to know George or found out his work you know, when I was CEO of Obesity Prevention Australia, and his book, uh, I think it was Weight Loss for Food Lovers, uh, was just miles ahead of the game. It really, everything we focus on these days about intuitive eating and not overly restricting and really looking at, at weight loss from a, a mental, emotional side of things, uh, it was amazing. And, and that's where I sort of got onto him. But then it's like, well, actually his real expertise for 30 years is relationships. So um, welcome to the podcast, George. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, guys. Super excited to have you on board. We've got a lot of deep questions that I'm sure so many parents and just people are going to be really interested to hear your answers and, and learn from you. So yeah, thank you so much for being here with us today. Absolute pleasure, Ashley. Well, let's uh, dive straight into the, the big topics. Let's go straight into relationship conflict. Um, I think that's... Uh, no holding back. <laughs> let's not start small. <laughs> Uh, yeah, basically, where do you see where that most of that comes from and, and, and what are some tools for us to, to really get around that? Because I think pretty much all of us have it. And I know for myself, it's my number one stress on the occasions where it's there. It can change my whole day, change my whole week. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's step back here. To really make sense of conflict in a relationship, we've, we've really got to pull back to 30,000 feet and appreciate a couple of points. Now, the first one is that we are naturally drawn to people who are different from us. Now, not complete opposites necessarily, but we are drawn to people who complement us. That's, I think, the best way of putting it. Extroverts are typically drawn to introverts and vice versa. People who uh, have attention to detail are often drawn to people who have big picture thinking. And this has obvious benefit for both the couple working more effectively as a couple, but also for their children. Think about what it means for children if their parents were both the same, if both parents, for example, were introverts or both parents were attention to detail people and you have a child who's the opposite, what's gonna to happen to that child and why they, the, the way they see themselves fitting into the family? More importantly, how good are the parents gonna be with empathizing with that child's experience? So this complementarity is and any dog breeder knows that we have better quality dogs. And yes, I am going to bring that into the human breeding situation as well. <laughs> we have better quality dogs that we have better quality children if we mix up the pedigree, right? If we bring in people who are more different. You know, mongrel dogs are much tougher than purebred dogs. So there's a big evolutionary drive for us to be in relationships with people who are complementary to us. And of course, that leads to conflict. So that's the first thing I'd like everybody to sort of think about is that there's a significant degree of conflict, which is a function of the nature of who we are best in a relationship with. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes a lot of yeah. sense. And, and, and that means that we then have to accept that the other side of that coin is because our partner thinks differently from us. And that's a big benefit to a relationship. We want a partner. My, my wife's the detail person. I'm more the big picture person. When it comes to us looking at buying a property or investing in something or just looking at planning a holiday, she'll read the insurance detail. I won't. You know, my, my, my standard line is, look, we're not going to employ a lawyer to change it, so there's not a lot of point in reading it. But my wife <laughs> does. And, and as a result of that, we make better decisions as a team. So complementarity is really essential to, a, to a, a well working relationship and also demonstrating that to children, how we, we negotiate that. But it will mean that we, I often hear my patients talking about if only my partner thought the same way I did on this issue, we wouldn't have the conflict. And true, you probably wouldn't, but you'd make much worse decisions and things wouldn't go as well for the couple. So this brings us to the importance of respecting differences. We need to respect, we need to remember that we, we married our partner often because they're complementary to us in certain ways, and that brings real value. But that means we're going to have conflict, and we have to remember that that conflict is normal, healthy conflict. And I want to marry that with just one other big 
you know, high level point. And that is, I was hearing about a study recently where they followed these couples over a number of years. And these longitudinal studies are very expensive studies to do. And of the, the, the uh, couples in the study, there were a dozen who had no conflict at the, they, they were rated as having the lowest level conflict of any of the couples in the study. Guess who got divorced down the track? Not one of those couples that had no conflict survived when it came to looking at their divorce down the track. Mm -hmm. This brings in another really big issue here. And so you can see where I'm going here. We've got to see conflict very differently. It's not a bad thing. Mm. It's, it's something, it, it, it's talking. So what, what's happening with those couples is they're not dealing with issues. They're not communicating, right? Exactly. And, mm. and effective communication means talking about problems. Right? Not suppressing them. Exactly. And so what you're seeing with those couples is they're all getting divorced because they're not dealing with shit. They're not dealing with the problems that are coming up in the relationship. They're not setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. They're not setting limits. You know, and a lot of these comments, of course, when, and what I love about this show is we're talking about what, what we do with our partners, but also with our children. Yeah. It's, it, th these are principles that just speak to human interrelatedness. And they're not, they wouldn't even be expressing and communicating their needs and their desires either, not, not only the problems, but it would be working both ends. They're just not connecting to communicate any of it. So you can see how that would definitely break down. And, and so that brings us to the, the killer point that I want to make here, which is that most growth in a relationship comes from the conflict. Oh, I so agree. It, it's not mm. just that it's something that we've got to learn to accommodate. It's actually something we've got to learn to embrace mm. because those couples who aren't having conflict, they ain't growing the relationship. And so what that brings us to fairly logically is that couples need to get good at fighting and fighting fairly and fighting respectfully, but they have to argue, they have to fight, but they've got to do it in a way that doesn't leave people hurt. It doesn't leave people angry. That doesn't leave people doubting themselves. Yeah, such a good point. I, I can definitely relate to that. I'm sure you can too, Levi, but just like I've been with my partner for nearly 14 years and definitely the hardest times have brought so much more closeness because you understand yourself more, you understand them more, you get more clear on your boundaries and you communicate their boundaries and it does bring more closeness and helps you navigate problems better next time yeah with more love more respect so i totally feel you on that it's a it's a nice way to look at conflict now actually what you've done is you've brought in another issue there which uh is, is very very worthwhile for us to spend a bit of time on what you're talking about there is how we get to know each other mm. and we get to know what are really key issues for ourselves now my wife and i've been married 34 years just had our wedding anniversary last saturday Congratulations. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, but awesome. the point of the story, the point of the story is only about two months ago, I learned more about myself and our relationship and how that had been playing out for years after 33 years of marriage. Mm. And so, and, we're, and, and my wife's a psychologist, right? So I'm a psychiatrist, she's a psychologist. And, and we both do couple therapy. I do a bit more of it than she does. But we are acutely aware of these issues. But here we are, 30 odd years into our marriage, still working out and I'll, I'll share a little bit of it um because there were times when i would get quite short and irritable with my wife and she would often complain about my irritability and then i was reflecting on this and thinking about you know, i decided to bring some of my work home and uh and look a little bit deeper as to what was going on here and i realized that growing up i had a very my father was a gp he was a, a very hard working doctor he worked very long hours and he would often get home after dinner and he'd want to come in and chat when we were literally getting ready for bed and it just it didn't work. What saved him, by the way, which we can come back and talk about, is every Sunday he made time to spend with his kids and stop working. And that really saved his relationship with his four boys. But the point of the story was that my dad was never very good at seeing me and knowing certain elements of me that I saw as pretty central to who I am. And what I realized when my wife would raise an issue about something I had done or said or, or what she thought I hadn't appreciated, 
and it triggered that same experience that I had with my dad, that was when I'd get really short and irritable with her. And I realized, again, here we are 30 odd years in, that she was triggering that dynamic with my dad. And so once we discussed that, I said, you know what, I think this is what's going on here. And she said, yeah, I get it. Because, you know, she knew my dad, he's he died a couple of years ago now. But, but yeah, that element of him was something that we all kind of knew that he was very much, you know, dedicated to his work. And he really lived in his head a lot of the time and just didn't see what was happening with his kids around him. So the point being is that that was an issue in our marriage on and off for you know, the whole time. 30 odd years. But since we've discussed that, it's almost disappeared. Except when she really does irritate me for good reason. But if we put that aside, <laughs> it, 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 that, that particular dynamic, and, and of course the key is I need to be aware of it mm. and she's aware of it. But of the two of us, I've got to take more responsibility because it's my issue, not hers. It's lovely when your partner understands these buttons that can be pressed and and helps to not press them. You yeah. know, the worst thing that happens in between couples is when it's at the other end of the spectrum, when they work out how to really piss each other off and they press those buttons reliably. Mm. That's, a, that, that, that's a pretty, you know, that's a relationship in a pretty destructive place. So, yeah, it's this idea of coming to understand our partners, our vulnerabilities, working out how that fits into the relationship, and recognizing that we married these people who that we're spending the rest of our life with because they have certain traits that we value over here but the flip side of those coins are things that piss us off over here mm, it's like children hey like your partner is such a mirror of what you need to heal like when they trigger you it's not normally about them it's about something that's you know within yourself that you need to heal and it's like a highlighter beaming in your face because <laughs> they're right there irritating you but it's actually yeah, showing you what you need to unpack. And and so that brings us to another key element of a successful relationship, and that is that sense of safety, mm. that you can be vulnerable and unpack. Yes. That. And, and it's really powerful when you've got a partner who genuinely cares about you, who's trying to work out with you what's happening here. And between the two of you, you kind of workshop it and go, oh, that's what's happening when we have that particular interaction mm -hmm. you know Gottman uh, John Gottman who's the legend in the yeah. relationship space I'm sure you guys have come across him he uh, gives us this very interesting statistic that 69% of the points of conflict between couples are not resolvable uh, and I would say certainly not re resolvable in the short term but I think couples do learn in the longer term how to resolve that now if 69% of the time we're not going to work out we're not going to come to a solution we've got to work out what we're going to do around that. Mm. And, and this is where we begin got to rethink conflict because again, if, if that, that John Gottman was, if I can just digress very quickly, John Gottman was an unusual psychologist because he was a mathematician first. And so he did something, he looked at the research design of most studies on couples and he realized that we hadn't studied the control group. We hadn't studied normal behavior. And those of us practicing in the space, we just thought what a good marriage did was the opposite of what a bad marriage did. And that just simply is not true. One of his most yeah. profound findings was that in a, what he called a successful relationship, the difference in negative interactions between a bad marriage and a successful marriage was not terribly significant. There was lots of negative interactions, but... The big difference was in the amount of positive interactions that outweighed the negatives. And in a problematic marriage, it's a little tiny, you know, you know, length on a, on a bar chart compared to a very long one for the successful couples. I'm doing a very poor job of representing graphics, particularly the people who are just listening to us. But, but the point is that in a successful marriage, there's lots of positive interactions happening around the negative interactions. Mm. In a bad marriage, there's, there's, almost no positive interactions happening around a similar amount of negative interactions. And then there's a third group, which actually harks back to what we said earlier. There's a third group who have very little in the way of negative interactions, but they also have very little in the way of positive interactions. That's a relationship where somebody's given up and the relationship has got some fairly significant issues in it.
Mm. So. so interesting. And I love that you brought that up because I actually watched a video last week on him and he was talking about that positive interactions and me and my husband watched it. And it, it was just good to have that reminder to nurture your partner and to pick up on the little things. You know, when you first get in a relationship and you appreciate and love everything about them and you compliment them and it's just, you know, they are your world. And then as time goes on, you have kids and you get stressed. You just, those little moments are the actual really important ones day, day by day. It's not the big significant birthday present. It's like day by day, your little actions and compliments and appreciation that really makes it, hey. This, this brings us you know, to the heart of the transition we have to make is what you spoke there actually about how early on we in the honeymoon phase, we're just so ready to see not, not just all the good things our partner does mm. but we'll completely ignore all of the, all of the bad things that they do at the same time, which is what makes the honeymoon phase, the honeymoon phase mm. you know, really is rose colored glasses turned up to full volume. And what we really need to recognize is that kind of romantic love. And this is where I'm going at the moment in my research. I'm really interested in how we've come to give romantic love such a big place in the way we think about long-term relationships. When historically, the wisdom of the ages is that that is not what you build a long-term relationship on. Long-term relationships are built on a very different kind of love. And that's something that I want to make sure we come back to. Mm. But this idea of that romantic love, you're right, it's these little things that we can do on a day-by-day basis that let our partner know that we see them and where we accommodate them. You know, there's this other interesting research in how you manufacture love. I love this research. It, It was done by a guy called Epstein in California. He's now at Harvard. And... He showed that if you put people together, and he was a, his wasn't actually the first research, but he did more recent research. He said that if you put people together in certain circumstances that don't love each other, there's no romantic love, and you create certain experiences between them, a significant percentage of them fall in love. And this is why doctors marry nurses, bosses marry secretaries, co-workers marry co-workers, and what we then sadly do is we go back and remanufacture that story to turn it into finding the one, which is not what happened at all. We, Epstein estimates that we can, we can have a healthy relationship with around 350,000 people on the planet. This, this idea of the one is complete bullshit. Mm. It's something that Disney indoctrinated us with from a young age, and we've all forgotten that indoctrination process, like all good indoctrination. And now we think that's how it works. It isn't how it works at all. And what we've got to recognize is that you can manufacture love if you put people in the right situation and you get them to do things like have fun together, share secrets, be vulnerable, have an adventure together, particularly one that requires them to rely upon each other. And if you put couples in these situations that don't know each other, a significant percentage of them fall in love not falling at all we're just manufacturing it Mm, i believe that yeah is that how all these shows are are coming out at the moment um where they're where they're putting people in these situations is that based on this research to try and to try is it actually some real love in 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 regards to these shows levi i would love to think that these shows were based on anything that vaguely approached research but no, um, I think they're, they're, they're very much based on what is the most dramatic stuff you can make happen on television in front of a camera with people who have no idea what they're signing up for. The married at first sight thing is, is I, I guess it makes for, for interesting television, but my God, it's hard on those people who have no idea the forces that are at work in these processes. And I get most annoyed at the psychologists who are advising them who step back and let all this shit happen, which I would think is very unethical. But that's another story. Yeah. It's all just clickbait, those shows. (laughs) If we go back to the conflict you were talking about earlier, like it really, like when you're talking about the irritation in yourself and and even without the, the, the talking with your partner, right? even just the awareness of yourself, like how much of our conflict comes just from our own triggers and through healing. Like I've been surprised with how many clients I've had that 
their relationships where they're like, it was comes in, it's like, I can't stand this woman or, you know, whatever the other way. And just through working through their own triggers and trauma, the relationship is better. So how much of it is interplay and how much of it is just on us? Levi, that's a really, really important question. I'm, I'm really grateful to you for asking that. Let me um, come at it from a couple of angles. One is that when I start working with a couple, I will say to them, you guys are going to come in here and tell me about your partner's problems and why that has left you in an unhappy relationship. Your therapy will not go anywhere useful until you start coming in here and telling me what you're doing to contribute to the problems in this relationship. And that that is probably, I would suggest, I haven't done or seen research on this, but certainly clinically, that transition point where people stop blaming their partners and start looking at themselves is the point where therapy seems like we're going nowhere to it going somewhere really powerful. It's hard for people to hear though, isn't it? Look, we would all love... You know, I, 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 at one, there's a part of me that would love my wife to be responsible for all the problems in our relationship. <laughs> and because you're perfect, right? <laughs> no, no. Actually, I love it when people say, "No, I know I'm not perfect," but what they're thinking is, "Nobody's perfect, but I'm the next best thing." I'm pretty close. <laughs> and yeah, that's right. And the truth of the matter is, none of us are vaguely close to perfect. No. And we have to, you know, so the, the job is to work out. One of my patients after, you know, a couple of years of couple therapy, and that's the other thing, it does take a while. And I think one of the reasons why therapy takes a while is to get people to make that transition. But after after a couple of years, he said to me, um, he said, I think I've got this whole couple therapy thing worked out. And I said, yeah, what do you got? And he said, I think it's just a matter of working out whose shit is whose and most of it is your own. Uh and and that that that's 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 pretty true there's another reason why we want to blame ourselves rather than our partner and people don't like it when i put this to them but you'll get the point if we blame ourselves there's something we can do about us mm. as long as the problem lies with our partner our child a workmate there is nothing we can do other than get them into therapy and they're not going to appreciate that suggestion at all so we have to recognize that by looking at ourselves, and sometimes I have to work with one half of a relationship, which is really tough therapy at one level because the other, part just, the other partner just refuses to come in. And of course, I have to say, look, we're looking at perhaps one of the biggest problems that you can have in a relationship. And this marries nicely into what I was saying before about how we will marry people who are opposite to us in some ways who are complementary, right? What we do have to have alignment in is values. So we can have very different personalities. We can have very different interests, but we can't have very different personal values because personal values are things that we will place an enormous amount of weight upon and argue to the death on. So I guess the, the example that I always like here is Bonnie and Clyde they worked pretty well together because both of them thought that robbing banks and killing people wasn't a problem. And, you know, but you can see that if one person thinks that robbing banks and killing people is a big problem, then that relationship doesn't go very far, right? So you've got to have alignment in core values. So what are core values? Okay, well, things like honesty, integrity, um, how you want to pay your taxes or not pay them. Uh, but there are other things too that are quite different, like, family values. Do you want to have a family? Do you want to have children or not? You know, either position is, is understandable, but you need to sort that out beforehand because if one wants to have a child, the other one doesn't, you got a big problem. Mm -hmm. So there are religious values are another one. Again, you can have a, you can have a mixed religion relationship provided one is fairly open to the other person's religious position, but it doesn't work well if you have two people who are traditional orthodox, in their religions that are opposed to each other. So we have to have an alignment of these core resources and we have to have awareness of where we sit around those issues. But go back to your point, Levi, because it's such an important one. The 
beginning, I think, of building a really healthy relationship happens when, and, and often it's one person who then says, I need to look at me, I need to look at what I can do better. And then as they do that, their partner watches and their partner sees them becoming a better partner. And this beautiful thing happens where the other partner then starts to think, huh, I need to lift my game here. And that's where treating one person first in the relationship does actually work. But it's often a big ask for them because they're watching their partner do things that, well, they're not, as, as we've said, we, we don't want to be blaming our partner, but we do want to have partners who will bring their best game. And that's the core value that I was coming back to here, that when you've got a relationship where one part, party wants to grow and the other one isn't interested in growing, you've got a really big problem. That's a big value, right? Mm -hmm. mm. Definitely is. Yeah, with values too, do you feel like, because I mean, that's, you know how values have priorities, like this is our, my number one value, the next one. It, it's like if your top ones are really aligned, then then things can work through, right? We can, even if you're, the ones underneath are maybe, maybe a little bit alternate, um, but if you're both into growth and improving and you're both into etc then you can sort of work through anything is that how you'd see absolutely it? and in fact you know if somewhere up in the top ones is tolerance and patience then the rest of them further down become much less of a problem but if you're intolerant and not patient then some of those ones further down the list of importance can become a really problematic issue so yeah really it's a really nice point that you're playing with here levi and i like the way you're thinking about it it brings us, I was at a workshop many, many years ago and Wally Goddard was his name. I, I love Wally. He let me use some of his recordings afterwards. He's an American couple therapist. And one of the things that he said in this, uh, in this workshop was he was asked, what's the single most important thing in a happy relationship? And he surprised me by saying patience. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, well, what about trust and loyalty and love and integrity and consideration? You know, he goes, no, it's, it's patience. And he, he, as he kept on talking, I realized what he was getting at because patience is an action. It's something we do. You can't think you're, you're patient if you're not actually being patient, right? Patience is about what you do when your partner is annoying you or your children are annoying you. And what he was getting at was patience is a final common pathway of most of those other things. So you can't really say you're being loving and considerate if you are impatient with your partner. With me? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Equally, if you weren't being loving and considerate, but you were actually really patient with your partner, you're actually doing a pretty good job most of the time. That's so but true. Patience is about that. It's the final common pathway, the point of interaction with your partner that lots of other things feed into. And of course, when we're being patient, we're often also being thoughtful. We're sitting there thinking, okay, well, why is my partner doing this that I could get annoyed at? Or why is that so important to him or her? Why are they so worked up about this? While you're being patient, which means you're not responding, you're not buying in, there's a good chance that we're thinking what's happening here and most importantly, what can I do to help them? Mm, I suppose when you're being patient, yeah, you're not reacting, you're pro processing, you're allowing space, you're holding space for them. You've got time to think about what you're saying and get clear and then you can speak with more love. Whereas when you're not patient, you're going to be a lot more reactive. And, ah. and, 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 and you're right, actually, in that reaction, we often get ourselves into more trouble. Yeah, 100%. So that's why it's so important too, once again, for yourself to be having your daily rituals and habits that keeps you really grounded and calm and, and centered so that when you do come come into conflict with your partner, you're, you're ready for it. You're equipped. And again, let's add children to this too. I mean, tired, oh, yeah. tired young, irritable children, uh, mm. you know, it's exactly the same challenge. So, yeah, yeah we... Patience, I think, is, is, a, is a profound virtue that we want to bring because it's a very practical one. Uh, as, as I've said, you can't be a terrible partner if you're really patient. What a great takeaway. Like if anyone's going to take away anything from this podcast alone, that, like even for me, that's, that's huge just to 
focus on being more patient. We, I've got two kids now and, and a husband. So <laughs> yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Well, don't thank me. Thank, um, thank Wally Goddard for that. I'm just passing. I'm just Wally. passing. Yeah, I'm just passing on his wisdom. Love your work, Wally. <laughs> yeah, with patience. I'm going to play devil's advocate then, um, because uh, one of the phrases I hear a lot from males is "happy wife, happy life," and it seems like um, the partner disengages, so they seem quite patient, but they're they're actually just unable to process the conflict or actually. Um, is that, is that helpful? I mean, it, it obviously is helpful, but where is it, where's the balance between that being helpful and destructive? Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that phrase up because it does come up and I'll use it too, but I do have some caveats around it, but let's stick with, let's go to the first one, which I think speaks to your question, Levi. You're not making your wife happy just by ignoring it and not dealing with an issue. That's not going to make her happy. Women more so than men are very tuned in to the need to work through a problem, largely so it doesn't happen again, right? That's something that is a pretty good reason for why we need to have conflict. And I need to talk about how it is normal for couples to not be able to resolve issues in the first instance. They need to calm down and do it, have, have a second go at it, right? I always talk about conflict management having two phases. The phase where it begins, and, and this is very relevant to our, I think, overarching question here, which is how do we fight well? And we want that first phase to end fairly quickly because very rarely will we handle it well. Often we're tired, we've been caught unawares, our partner's blaming us for something, we've, we've immediately fought back. And what we know that successful couples do is they very quickly exit that phase and then they revisit it later on when they've calmed down really with the purpose of making sure that those that particular problem becomes less of an issue over time and we can only do that if we revisit it and this is where i use the metaphor of anybody who's played team sports they know the process after a game at the end of it coach sits down and says right how could we have played that game better whether it was a game that went well or badly what could we have done better and, and a good coach knows how to do that in a way that is not blaming any of the players for things that went wrong. You know, it, the, the coach knows that we're going to talk about the process, we're going to talk about what, what happened and not about the person behind it because we all make mistakes. And, you know, sometimes it's going to be one partner, other times it's going to be another. So getting partners to just do this very simple exercise of go through what was a point of conflict and why purely with a view to what could we do differently next time? Let's not work out who's to, who's to blame here. That just goes badly. But what could we do differently next time so that the frequency of that problematic interaction becomes less and less? And that requires a degree of engagement. So if we're truly going to make our wives happy, then we need to engage at that kind of level and just ignoring behavior or ignoring issues won't make them happy. And that's why I think that short saying is, is quite pithy at that level because it's not, you know, ignored wife, you know, an ignored wife is not a happy wife. So what we've got to then think about is why do we say, you know, happy wife, happy life? but we don't have an equivalent for the women saying that about the blokes. And the reason why is they're much better at working that shit out than we are. They don't need to be reminded. Mm. Most, most women are better at thinking, they recognise that you know, if they can have a happy partner, they'll be happier. Mm. We blokes make a bit of a disconnect there. We sometimes want to let out our frustration and we kind of hope that our partner will wear it, but that they'll still be happy, which is why we need the saying and they don't. There you go. <laughs> um, I would love to lead on a little bit more to kids because I know we've touched on kids and relationships, um, but being a new parent again, I've got a nearly three-month-old little girl and I've got a seven-year-old boy and... Levi's about to have his second baby in a month time and I was briefly talking to Levi about how I'd love to chat with you about just becoming parents but particularly that first year because 
it's a common conversation with me and my girlfriends in that first year, you know, things, it's, it's a lot, it's a big change. There's the hormones, there's the lack of sleep. There's all of a sudden, especially for new, new parents, your partner isn't your number one priority. All of your energy is going into your child. And logically, you know, it's a season, you know, that this is what has to happen. But this time around being a lot more conscious and a lot more aware of what we did wrong first time, it's still really hard. Like we're, we're aware to make sure that we're still having those touch points and having our intimacy and making time for each other. But it still feels quite hard because you are so tired and your kids require so much of you. It's hard to kind of keep that spark alive and miss the old, the old connection. I, I can give you a takeaway for this. It's, it's a relatively simple solution. So there are three ways in which we solve the problem of the relationship being under that much stress, as it so often is. I mean, you're so right. That, that, those, those fir that first year, particularly if the woman develops a degree of postnatal depression, if the kids have got any illnesses or any disabilities, it can put enormous pressure on a relationship. And often it isn't just for that first year, as you know, it's, it's two, three years. And for some marriages, it becomes the turning point in the whole marriage was the point at which the kids came along. So yeah, how do we fix the problem? Three things, babysitters, babysitters, <laughs> and babysitters. Gra grandparents, a nanny, babysitters, <laughs> any kind of help. And, and that's the thing. It, 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 I, I realize a lot of people can't necessarily afford to pay a babysitter, but there are so many, you know, responsible teenage girls out there who love kids, who, you know, you can pay not a lot of money to come in for at least. And so this is for one night a week or it can be a cup, it can be a lunchtime, but it, it, it's nice for it to be a meal. It's got to be really kind of a date, right? Yeah. And one, one, one date a week, just the two of you, no kids, and mm. you've got to go out. It can be the cheapest BYO restaurant you can find, fish and chips, whatever, but you've got to go out so that one of you isn't having to cook and you can both actually just connect. And so there's a couple of rules about date night in this situation after our, we've covered off on the first three rules. And that is that we do not talk about potential conflict issues. This is a time to have fun. What I, what I encourage couples to do is to talk about or plan, plan for more fun than you can have. Holidays, weekends away, time with friends, whatever. That's a nice thing to talk about on a date night. You can talk about issues with other people in your life that might you want to just get your partner's support on. But you don't talk about problems between the two of you. That, that, that's called gripe time. And we also need to make time for that. But that's a whole other story. But it, it, is, it is such a simple thing to do. And it just changes it for most of the couples I work with. Because everybody thinks that because you're living in the same house 24-7 or except for when we're at work or out or whatever, that you're having an intimate relationship. And you just aren't. You can live under the same roof and have no meaningful intimacy for days on end. Yeah. So if that's, I love that. And with my first child, we did that every single week. I was lucky to have my mum living here. She doesn't live here anymore, but it was easy for us to um, give my son to her each Saturday night. What about day to day though? We're talking about those little interactions, a little appreciation, like they, they, they really matter as well. So I suppose just being more conscious to compliment, to appreciate, to Give a smack on the bum or a little shoulder massage, you know, some, some kind of touch and connection. Absolutely. And of course, the, the reason why I find myself, whether I'm doing sex therapy or cup, you know, couple therapy around these issues, scheduling things is mm. because, yes, it's a nice idea to do these things on an ad hoc basis. I can tell you from real world experiences, I'm sure you guys know, you can try and do these things on an ad hoc basis, but we all get busy, distracted, distressed by different pressures and Interrupted. it goes out the window. <laughs> yep. Yep. So that's why I get people to schedule these times. And if you schedule a time to have a special you know, time together, whether it's sex or whether it's going out on a date, and I, and I do get people to schedule sex as well, because again, we make the point in, when we're doing sex therapy that, the chances of getting two people who have got busy lives to both spontaneously want to have sex at the same time 
is below zero. Mm -hmm. And what, what that means is that couples have to schedule sex and, but then they both know it's going to happen and they can gear up towards it. You know, people, this idea that it should be spontaneous is just such rubbish. If, fantasy if we were, and... It is, you know, mm -hmm. it's great for the honeymoon period when you, you know, spend a lot of time with each other, but yeah. doesn't work in a busy life. And, and schedule and, and what otherwise happens while we're on the issue of sex is there's just this pattern you see so often. It's not always the male driving it, but typically, you know, probably 60% of the time, the male's asking for sex, the woman's going, no, I'm too tired, too busy, whatever. And they keep on asking and the woman feels guilty and gives in around, I don't know, the second or third or fourth time the guy's asked. And this becomes a pattern where now they're having sex when neither of them particularly want it, but because the guy has, knows that about now, if I, if I ask the third or fourth time, she's going to say yes out of guilt. I was just reading a study this morning, which surprised me a little bit, that showed that sexual satisfaction in a marriage correlated primarily with happiness in a marriage mm -hmm. and with non-sexual elements of the marriage. Now, I don't think that's necessarily saying that sex makes for a happy marriage because it can work back the other way. Association is not causation. You can have a situation where couples who have a better relationship are more likely, I think, to have better sex because they're going to be better at communicating around their needs. They're going to feel prepared to be vulnerable with each other. These things that make for a better sex life. But that's, you know, we can probably do a whole show on, on, on that side of things. But the mm. point being that it's it's all in there together and mm. it, it, you know what the research if you if you reverse that research you didn't have people who had a bad sex life and a happy marriage yeah i have heard the scheduling sex i was quite resistant against that when my partner suggested that years ago because i just you want it to be fantasy and exciting but in reality especially when you have kids i think personally it yeah it just doesn't happen <laughs> unless you're on holidays in, in the maldives or something which <laughs> These days, it's not happening. <laughs> and, and think about that. That's scheduled sex. It's scheduled for the holiday when you're in the beautiful place. Yeah. And yeah. that, yeah, and see, scheduled when you without schedule, scheduled, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but it, it, it's scheduled without the micromanagement, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is, it's still set up at a time when it's going to work for both of you. Yeah. When you're on holidays, right? And yeah. the way that works for, I'd say, 80% of the couples that I work with is that's probably a Sunday, whether it's morning or evening, depending on which they prefer, because that's like the closest we get to a holiday in the Maldives most weeks. Isn't that true? You're the most relaxed. You're not at work. Yeah, you're having your downtime. It's a day that you, you feel like you want to relax the most and you can without guilt, whereas during the week it's like work's priority and the to-do list. And... and Saturday is, you know, kids' sport or catching up with stuff. <laughs> And, and I do, you know, just talking more broadly, I do really, I, I check in with my couples that I'm working with to find out if they put aside at least one day a week, which again, 80% of the time will be Sunday. I mean, you get people in, you know, you get the FIFO guys and whatnot who have to do it differently. But, but for most couples, it, and the world lets you have Sunday off too. It fits in with mm -hmm. the world to, to, you know, not be available, to bum around in, in your trackies and, 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 and do what you like. And I really, you know, make sure that couples are having Sundays together and at least one meal a day together, which goes back to your earlier point, Ashley, about how we want to, on a day-to-day -day basis, also have a point of connection. And yes, if we can remember to do those small things of consideration and accommodation, which is where you, 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 you fit in around your partner to, to allow them to do what they want to do and accommodate, you know, their needs, uh, having one meal where there's no television on um, maybe with young kids after the kids have been put to bed or earlier if they're you know if we have to devices putting a kid in front of a device i think is worthwhile if the device is showing them something that's semi-educational which a lot of things are these days and it allows mum and dad to spend some quality time together mm, love that love that love all those points thank you that's awesome In, re in regards to the scheduling and uh, because I've used that in our relationship previously and it works, it, I agree, works well. Um, 
what do you advise in regards to when scheduling like meetings and and one party's like oh, i just have to cancel this or and so you feel but it can break down that that whole scheduling i'm sure you would have dealt with this at some point what's the what's the tool to um make that feel like it um it doesn't just you know a couple of cancellations and it sort of just falls away again i think and, and then the guilt comes back etc no it's, it's a, another excellent point so just like scheduling a business meeting, what happens if one of us can't make it? We reschedule it. We, we generally don't cancel it for next time unless if, if we're doing that, we probably don't need to be having the meeting in the first place, right? So what that means, I say to a couple, if for whatever reason you can't do it that day, then you've got to reschedule it. It doesn't get canceled. It gets rescheduled. And mm. the person doing the canceling has got to be responsible for, for, for finding another time. But you're right, because if we're having sex... <laughs> Such an easy solution. <laughs> yeah. If, if we're having you know sex once a week and we cancel two weeks in a row, then we're down to once every three weeks. Look, there are couples who are happily doing it once a week, sorry, once a month. But again, if that gets canceled for a couple of months, now there's a big... Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, just to finish up on this idea of sex, because I want to come back and talk about how we define love for a long-term relationship because it also applies to parenting children, which goes back to the, the children question. But the point I wanted to just sort of finish up there around sex is I think of sex like petrol in a car. Most people don't get into their car every time they take it and go, wow, isn't this petrol fantastic? They appreciate other things about the car that are more relevant. It's comfort. It's you know, the fact that it's getting them to where they need to go. It's got Bluetooth so they don't get you know, arrested for using their phone while they're driving. And, but if there's no petrol in the car, big problem. That's when we really notice the petrol in the car or the lack thereof, right? And it's a similar thing in, in, for couples. Yes, we want to have good sex, as, as, as good as any couple can make it. But in many ways, there's something that happens around sex. I'm not talking physically. Well, there is quite a bit that's happening hormonally. Release of oxytocin you know, dopamine, these are the love hormones that help settle us and relax us down. So that element of it is important. Whether we orgasm or not, that's not terribly central to the release of those hormones. But no, there's something else that happens when we're having the sexual side of the relationship, which is about what's actually defining that relationship as a relationship as opposed to a friendship. Because if there's no sex, then you're just friends. Literally, yeah. yeah. And we're not even friends with benefits. We're, we're friends without <laughs> benefits. And, and there is something a bit intangible about what a couple are doing when they're having sex that is creating an, a, a level of that relationship that would not otherwise exist. And so I see couples who will tell me they haven't had sex for a long time. They don't really miss it. If I can check with both of those individually, that's the case, then very rarely I, I, I see that being you know, workable. But often there's one person at least, and sometimes both of them, who feel that there's something missing out of the relationship. So the point is that we actually have to work at keeping that part of the relationship alive. It doesn't carry through naturally because it is driven by the romantic love kinds of experiences that are strong early on in a relationship. And this is all genetically engineered. We're built to get pregnant early on in the relationship. We're not built to get pregnant after middle age. So there are biological forces at work here as well as social, social forces at work and, and demands of our time that mean that as we get older, sex can fall by the wayside. And I think we lose that, that other important element of what makes a relationship special. Okay, my, my next question then, uh, going back again, probably to, to conflict, um, just because I, I know this is, um, is, is around modeling that for children. Um, one of my, I don't know if it's an, a, a, a relevant fear or, or not, but is, uh, because I don't, we like, I feel like as we've got better and, and done like Ashley and I've done so many, uh, communication courses together to grow, but also with my partner and as we've got better, the, the conflict yeah, you know, like they have hard conversations, but there's no real, um, 
I'd say yelling or anything like that. And what I think about with my daughter is in society, there is a lot of yelling. And um, I, I often wonder if I'm hot, like I need to do some yelling to, to make her be able to handle society better. I don't know if that's a, it's a weird question, but it's something that's been on my it's, mind. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really profound question because if we don't model conflict management to our children, they're going to get the world's weirdest version of it. And it's even weirder now with social media and the way people curate what they put out there. And we've got this fundamental problem where people are, you know, we're all insecure emotional beings at some level. And we'll typically compare our backstage with other people's front stages, which is a really bad comparison. But when it comes to learning about things like conflict, it is very difficult to get anything that's sensible from that you know, social media world because you get you get the extremes of it. So let's let, let's just break down what this should look like, I think, in a healthy in a healthy family. My wife and I, in fact, you, you mentioned the first book I published, which was oh, 17 years ago now on the psychology and sabotage of weight loss. Uh, but the book that we wrote before that, which never got published, was a book on raising children and in particular making sense of child discipline. And we wrote that because our children were young and we researched the hell out of this. And that was why the book never got published. The publisher said, look, people aren't, aren't really interested in the science. This is 20 years ago. No, my God, it was 25 years ago. They just want it to be your opinion as an expert. It's simpler to digest. And we said, we can't do that. We're both scientifically trained. We need to acknowledge the giants whose shoulders we're standing on. And we had this argument, we never resolved it and the book never got published, but we spent a lot of time in this space. So my wife and I were thinking a lot about what we would do with our own children. So what we did was this, we recognized that we had to have conflict in front of our children because so often clinically, we would ask our patients who were fighting badly, what did your parents model to you? And I got one of two answers, probably 90% of the time. I never saw them fight. Or when they fought, it went badly. And, you know, there was, there was aggression and violence. And so what are they left with? When it, I talk about, and I use the word conflict fairly freely here, I realise for a lot of your listeners, they're probably, that's conjuring up bad things for them, right? When I talk about fighting well, you know, fighting sounds like a terrible, terrible thing. But you're quite right, Levi, in this world that we want to enculturate our children into, we want them to see conflict and fighting and limit setting and boundary management as really healthy things. So, so we came up with this plan. We decided to have all mild to medium sized conflicts in front of the children where we could. And often that would be when we're driving in a, from a place. I remember a couple of times we actually said, let's, let's talk about that in the car with the kids in the back so that we yeah. can, you know, they can watch us have this fight, right? The, the really big fights, you know, the nines and tens out of tens, we took those to the bedroom or somewhere quiet, mainly because we didn't know how they were going to go. <laughs> and we don't want to model them if, if we're going to end up in, in, a, in a tragic divorce. But we wanted them to see how we got to where we would get to. So we would start the conflict. And sometimes, as I said, we would revisit, you know, often we resolve conflicts by coming back to them later when we've calmed down. So what we made a point of doing was if the kids saw the first part of the argument, we would then set up the second part of the argument over the dinner table in front of them so they could see how we got to the resolution. Mm. So I think this is, you know, for couples who are, who are wanting their children, and we don't, we're not always going to get it right, but we want our children to see how we do it and how we make mistakes and how it can go badly. But all in the context of being held by a loving relationship. Mm. And when it's held by a loving relationship, it usually won't, it shouldn't get too aggressive. And that means, of course, when the children are watching, it's really good at one level because it gets you better, it gets both of you to fight with more respect, you know. So, for example, we should never be calling. Sorry, Ashley. You're more conscious in front of your children, aren't you? Absolutely. And that's not a bad thing. So, you know, some of the rules about fighting fair and fighting well are you never call each other names. And if you do, you apologize. 
So, you know, from, you know, call, calling somebody any swear word, uh, I'm not sure what the limit is on the show, so we'll, 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 we won't go to the range, but any, anything that is a label, a pejorative label on somebody, then the part, your partner has the right to say, hold up a moment, I don't appreciate that, do you want to take that back? And the other per- person gives you that right, and my wife and I, and I, we do this with our patients, I, my wife and I road test pretty much everything we do with our patients, and what we, what we do is we say, if you have called your partner a name, you do want to stop and apologise for that, because there's just no place for it. Because what you do in good conflict management is you describe behaviour, what the person did that upset you and why it upset you, which is the principles of assertiveness and I statements and and just looking at without you know labelling the other person, why what happened hurt you and upset you. And there's just no room for name calling it. So once you get better at it, you realise there's... So if I give a simple example, there's a very big difference between saying... You always keep me waiting. You never think of my needs. You're so inconsiderate after, you know, your partner's gotten to an event late or, or left you waiting. Now, think about the message of that statement compared to when we use an assertive way of putting it, which is when you keep me waiting for half an hour when we've had an agreed time to meet, I feel like you're not considering me or my needs. And I'd really like us to work on how to avoid this in future. Like, I think you should be calling me and letting me know when, when you know you're going to be running late. See the tone of those two different interactions? Yeah, definitely. I love that you brought that point up too, Levi, because I've actually got a girlfriend and we had completely different upbringings. My parents yelled a lot, hence why that's something that I'm always working on. Um, But she grew up in a household where her parents never fought. So now in her relationship now, if conflict ever arises, she's just like, something's wrong. Like we we shouldn't be together. And she would just freak out and panic and thought the relationship should end because you shouldn't argue because my mom and dad never argued. I want a relationship like them. And she had to go to her parents and say like, are you guys just perfect or did you not communicate or what? And they always said, oh, no, we were just really cautious to never argue in front of you. We'd wait till you guys were at school and then all hell broke loose. <laughs> but it was, it was interesting that you brought that up because I don't think we have to put our kids through pain to learn or through, you know, traumatic times like yelling or whatever. That's a, that's a great story, Ashley. And mm-hmm. let me just take it a bit further, which goes back to your question too, Levi. We need our children to develop a degree of comfort in the face of conflict. Because Mm. if they can't develop that comfort, maybe comfort is the wrong word, but we're talking about just the ability to stay with it so they argue their point through. You know, you guys probably have staff as well, and I've learned over the years with different, particularly junior staff, when I start giving them feedback, I can make a pretty good guess about what used to happen in their family at home growing up when I just start to give them you know, assertively based negative feedback about what what the issue is and they get all distressed, think they're getting fired or end up in tears. You know that in their family, again, one of two things happened. There was either no modelling of this or it, got, it always escalated and went really badly. You must have such compassion when you can see that, like in the work that you're in, you just know, yeah, you can figure out what's happened. It certainly helps to have a bit of that, well, a lot of that understanding, I guess, of human nature. But it, to a certain extent, I wasn't very good in when I used to be in a management role. I wasn't very good at it because I kept looking after the staff under me instead of just managing them, which doesn't work. You know, it, it just doesn't work. But, but the point is, we want our kids because otherwise, if they can't stay in an argument because they're either going to escalate it too much or get too scared and withdraw from it, they're not going to be able to set their boundaries or or, or manage their, their other people's boundaries and, and their limits. Think about you know, sexual interactions between young people. You've got to, you know, yes, we want boys to listen to clear consent, but girls also need to be very good at saying no. And mm. if, if the number of times I've treated women who were you know had some form of sexual misadventure from you know less severe to very severe. Uh, there was often a situation where they felt they couldn't speak up mm. because this was not modelled to them. And, of course, the way we really get our kids to model having conflict is when they argue with us. And so teaching our children to argue well with us is a good thing to do, but we teach them how to do it respectfully without calling names, 
without it escalating by describing the behavior, not judging the person. And it's in those interactions between us that we can, I think, give our kids that wherewithal so they can go into the outside world. Yeah, it's a lot though, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, well, so my, the fear that I'm having then is, is uh, about, you know, that, that more violent or yelling, really, that's, that's a little bit irrational, as long as she's seeing and, um, and getting modeled, any sort of conflict where it's like, okay, we're working through this or between us, and she's used to being in this situation where she's not going over or under and, and she's getting comfortable in conversations that are tough, etc. Then, then that's that's quite positive, and that's that's fine. It doesn't need to have the to be. You don't need to be um, seeing yelling or something to to be okay. To be able to witness somebody else yelling and stay calm but still engaged is an incredibly powerful life skill. Yeah. The people who can do that in the in the world of business and most professions they're the people who will get promoted because that the, the higher you go up the, the, whatever tree it is that you're on the more likely you are going to be dealing with conflicts between staff between staff and, and and customers whatever it might be and the person who can stay engaged and but not be freaked out and and stay on on issue can de-escalate those conflicts and more importantly, not just de-escalate them, but actually get them to a resolution as much as one can. So this is where we we really want our children to have those skills where when they're getting emotional with us or we even get emotional with them, we get better at pulling back in the interaction and saying, look, I'm sorry, can we just take this down a bit? Give me a moment, can we come back to it? Or we can, if we can best of all model, look, I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. Can we come back? Because this is what I really want to say. And so we can model keeping engaged through a conflict. Then we are giving our kids not just a, an important life skill, but a, a life skill that I don't think most people end up with that will take them a very long way as they negotiate this thing we call life. Yeah, that makes sense. That's... um. I can, I can it's so so weird when you do it from your personal point you create this irrelevant or this weird fear around it but it's like hey if you can just get comfortable like since i feel so comfortable in conflict at the moment that even when it goes out i, I know that i like because i mean we've been practicing a lot and and it's like you can bring the conversation back into safety and when you know you can do that it's sort of um yeah i want to i'm gonna i thank you for that i'm gonna start really being mindful of modeling that conflict with her and i love that idea of doing that doing it with you with clara and i in front of her that's cool and also with with your children i think more so now even like with taj being a bit older being seven he's all of a sudden back chatting and got an answer to everything and i'm finding that really challenging but just to be aware of how i'm interacting with those moments with him is how he's going to learn how to navigate those conversations because he's definitely pushing buttons and 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 you're going to get a lot better at it too ashley which will then I need to. Then, yeah. you, then you take that in, in into your outside world as well you know these are we, we tend to have the most the most conflicted arguments with people closest to us mm. simply because we know the containment of the relationship is greater Mm. I remember Stephen Bidoff, who wrote a couple of books, particularly about raising boys. I think one of them was called Raising Boys. He told us this very entertaining st- story at a, at, a, at, a, at a presentation he gave about how he and his wife were in therapy because they just didn't seem to be dealing with some of the big issues. And they each admitted that they had real concerns about it getting out of control. I think his wife said that she was worried that he would leave him and and he said that he was worried that um, he would lose control. And and they sort of identified this problem. And he said it wasn't you know, 24 hours later that they were standing in the kitchen yelling at each other, smashing plates as they had the biggest argument of their life. But the point he was making was that they realized they had enough containment to actually have the conflict. And it's that that I think we probably should finish this, this on which is the love that needs to sit around 
all of these things for it to work. And I, I promised I would come back and talk about the form of love that, that keeps a long-term relationship sustained, which is quite different from romantic love. And that the way I think about this is I had to for, for you know, our book, but I've had to come up, come up with it for just working with, with couples because so often I'd have a patient say to me, when I talk to them about what they experienced growing up, because that's where we all get our first model of love. It's how our parents relate to us. And so often I would get this phrase where they said, oh, my parent, mother or father, love me in their own special way. Well, they then go on to describe an abusive relationship. And I realized that we have to, because that, what they're describing is a hope that their parents love them, despite the terrible way that they treated them. And I realized I had to come up with a way of, of defining love that made it clear to me and to my patients what was going on and whether love was really present in the relationship or not. And so over the years, I've come to the following definition of love, which is also the definition of love, what I call true love, that sits behind a successful long-term relationship. And it has two parts to it. The first part is all about acceptance. And the acceptance is around accepting your partner fully knowing their shortcomings but accepting them nonetheless and this is an, an interesting one because it requires vulnerability so many people these days when they're busy comparing their backstages with people's front stages on on social media when they get in a relationship think that they've got to be putting their best foot forward and looking fantastic the whole time and they don't realize that connection is actually built through people seeing our shortcomings and still wanting to be our friend, still still wanting to be with us. So that's the first part of it, but it requires being vulnerable. If we're not vulnerable, people can't get to, to know us. And, and more importantly, we won't know if they really love us because we're thinking, and I hear this so often, if they really love me, they wouldn't like me. And so the only way you're going to disprove that once and for all is to let people see your shortcomings, your insecurities, the things you worry about. No, not on the first date. I'm talking six months into a relationship. You know, we've got to get really good at this, right? But it's about, you know, being vulnerable so that we have the opportunity to accept the other person. They have the opportunity to accept us. So that's the first half of, of true love. And the second half, and this is it's built around this word commitment. And that, so the second half is a commitment to nurturing personal growth in ourself and the other person. Now, let's just break that down. If you're going to nurture somebody else's personal growth, you've got to empathically connect with them. You've got to know what they need next in their life that's important. And you've got to, and you, and you've got to know what it is that's going to be important to them over time. What are their bigger long-term desires? What do they need today, tomorrow to be happier, to, to feel better and what do they need in the long term. And that requires a deep empathic connection and awareness of, of who they are and what's important for them. But you'll notice the second part of that, we have to take responsibility for our own personal growth too. Mm. We can't rely on our partner to look after us. That's called being a martyr and that does not work. So as we, and it's indeed, as we work out how to grow ourselves, we often get better at working on how to grow our partners. Because that just that question of how do I grow myself takes us to a very powerful and, and complex space. And then our job is to work out how do we grow our partner. And people who aren't growing themselves can't really grow their partners and vice versa. So that, that, that second part of it is, is really, well, the second part of the second part, which is that we have to nurture personal growth in ourselves as well as our partner is, is central to it. So, so they're the two elements of it. But the other word in there that I want to come back to is commitment. You see, Feelings are ephemeral, and this is no more relevant when we're looking after an irritable three-year-old or seven-year-old who's you know, tired and, 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 and sleep-deprived. What we need to do in that moment is relate to them in a way that is not based on what we're feeling, because what we might be feeling for them at that moment is anger and being pretty pissed off at this little shit for making our life more difficult than we need it to be right now. And if we're using this kind of way of thinking about love, the commitment part is that we behave in a way that is nurturing to them, irrespective of how we feel. 
And that's mm. a shift if you think about it, right? Because I know everybody thinks about love as a feeling and it just, it just isn't. When you look at what makes long-term relationships work, it is this commitment to nurturing personal growth. If you want to work out where the feeling actually comes from the way I'm talking about love, it actually comes from the first part. I think we feel loved by our partner when we know that they still care about us despite knowing about our shortcomings and how imperfect we are. That is the feeling of love. But when it comes to being loving, it's about a commitment to behave in a way that we may not be feeling. Mm. And any parent, I think, gets Love that. that. Yeah. Tricky to do, but so amazing. <laughs> I, 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 I bet you do it all the time. I bet there are times when even your newborn, where they're crying, <laughs> irritable, and you don't respond to that. Mm, so true. It's always with love. You just be a yeah. good mother. Yeah. And there's times we won't, you know. There's times when they'll get under our skin and we'll, you know, withdraw, explode, whatever happens because we're all very imp very imperfect human beings. Why is it harder with your partner? Is it because we have higher expectations that they should do better and should know better? Or is with our kids we're more unconditional because the kids, you know, they don't know any better. But with your partner, you're like, you should know better. <laughs> wait, wait till your kids are about 14, 15 and 16 and then you'll put them in the, you'll put them in the same camp as your partner. Yeah. You should know better by now. I can imagine. Do you, do you think you will? Will what, Levi? Uh, like, I, I don't know if that was a joke or not. Maybe I'm taking it too literally, but do you think that you will put them in the same uh, level in regards to that? I think so. Even I was saying to you earlier, Levi, like even from bringing a newborn in, the expectations I now have of my seven-year-old are, are a lot higher. You, you do. So I can imagine when they're teens that you would. Look, they go from being um, a not abstract thing to abstract thing as they go through mm -hmm. puberty and they get much better at arguing with you. Ah, scary. And, and then if they start to read and they get some of the knowledge of the world behind in their mind as well, then you're in, you're in deep trouble. And that's the point where you are in a very similar boat, you know, as, as you are with a partner. Mm. But you're right, to a certain extent, we, we do expect more from our partners. And it's why I think we have our worst conflict with our partners. Yeah. Because, again, there is, there is hopefully more containment, mm. which means the relationship can hold that conflict. But this is what I'm saying to particularly professionals, business people, anybody who goes to a workplace, because you know, most people in the workplace are very good at not getting really angry with the people around them because it doesn't go well. And I say, bring your work home. Treat your partner the same way you treat your workmates when it comes to expressing anger. What do we do? We put in a bit more effort. We try and deliver the message more carefully. Sometimes we let it go through to the wicket keeper. So yeah, it, we've got to, that. That's work we do have to bring home. No, um, this is purely just for me. I don't know if anyone else has thought of this, but when you were saying the the real creating real love, right? And one of the things you said was acceptance and understanding that commitment. Um, I went through this values exercise or, or last Friday where it was sort of, you had to list on a wall the top 10 things in life you couldn't live without and, and then you had to take them away. And it was like a tricky way of understanding what you really couldn't live without. And my number one was Neve, right? Like, and it was just like, okay, that's just impossible for me to move. And my number two, like, it feels like it should be Clara, but when I processed it down, I put me time and growth above her because I, in my head, I'm like, if I don't have me time and growth, I turn into a horrible person. And um, because I feel like love is a verb and that you have to act love, I feel like if I didn't do those two, I, I, maybe I got too deep on this, but I wouldn't have her because she'd be like, see you later. Um, and so <laughs> process me. <laughs> and you put, your, you put your daughter above your partner? Well, it was like the, the the process was the things you can't live along. And, and basically I had Neve there because I'm like, I can never leave her. There's no way that she's part of me, right? But Clara was in at number four because I was like, there is still like, yes, we are bonded and I want to be together forever. But there's a realization based on past relationship breaking up that if I have certain needs that I know that I don't get met, I, I'm not a very as nice of a person as I am. And I, I feel like, you know, like Neve can never leave me, even if, as much as I screw up. Whereas I, it was just a weird 
thing that you bringing up just before made me go, okay. So I'm familiar with that exercise. It's actually, it comes out of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Act. And it's a very useful exercise, particularly when you're looking at two people working out where they will maybe have issues as they come together or not. But the point I, well, the point I'd make there is, is I absolutely agree. We're no use to anybody if we aren't looking after ourselves. You know, the old Greek idea of physician first heal thyself is all about that. We, we're no use to helping anybody if we aren't looking after ourselves. So it's, it's about putting your own oxygen mask on first before you put that on your kid. I solely agree on that. And it's like that whole I, we, and all, it should be like you first and then we as in your your family and your friends and then all as your community. That I needs to be number one. Otherwise, you can't overflow to them, right? Yeah, no. I, I, it's, it's, it's Again, it's a, I, I, I've got to say, I, I really enjoyed the uh, quality of the questions you guys have brought up. These are really, really lovely questions that take us into some really big issues here. So I just want to compliment you both on on having such a, a thoughtful approach to your podcasting. Thank you so much for coming on today. I know I have learned so much and our audience would have got so much out of this. I'm sure they're going to want you to come on again. Maybe we could do a part a part two in six months' time or something. But thank you so much for your time. I've really learned a lot and um, got a lot of value out of it. My pleasure. Yeah, me too. Always love chatting to you. Thank you.